otherwise known as Forum BX257, your friendly neighborhood 1980s G.I. Joe reviewer, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the 1988 Micro Figures Collection. These one and three quarter inch PVC figurines represent one of 20 different classic G.I. Joe and Cobra characters. They were first made available as random bonuses in the late 1988 and early 1989 carded figures. However, after that, they took a very strange road to get into the hands of consumers. And this is typically how the micro figures were released on cards. With a little advertising sticker, this gold triangular sticker in the upper left hand corner. And the micro figures occupying their own bubble for once. Because typically pack-in premiums were just stuck in with the figure bubble. So any figure that had the micro figure on it actually has a variant arrangement of bubbles. Of course, on top of that, you have your little advertisement flyer. Which acts as a checklist for all 20 of the figures that you could get. But on top of that, it also advertised a micro figures poster, rather large one actually. But we'll get to that in a moment. After this, the full set of 20 plus the poster were available for mail order from 1990 to 1992. This is where the clear plastic tray that could hold all 20 comes from. The outer box was just a plain brown cardboard box with numbers printed on it. Overstock of this set was available in 1996 for the third annual G.I. Joe convention in Arlington, Virginia with a gold convention sticker added. In 1992, Tonka used the Duke figurine mold for its die-cast desert vehicle action set. This figurine is unpainted tan plastic, not PVC. And finally, in 1993, four figurines were offered as random giveaways in Walmart's kids' meals and paired with four micro-vehicles. It was kind of a knockoff of the McDonald's Happy Meal toys idea. Grunt came with the Mobat, Roadblock with the Awe Striker, Wetsuit with the Warthog, and Bazooka with the Persuader. And here's an interesting fact. The figurines were never released in Europe. Instead, the eight micro-vehicles took their place as random inserts on carded figures. The micro-vehicles are not compatible with the figurines and were available only as a mail-away premium in North America. The figures are made of a soft PVC, so while you might have to worry about warping, you don't really have to worry about breakages. Except for the gun tips, you do have to watch out to make sure that they're still intact. Also, all the figures have a 1989 copyright on the base. And here are the micro figures arranged in alphabetical order. And I'll go over each individual figure on in a bit. But I have to say, as a whole, they're actually very well sculpted and very easily recognizable as the characters they're supposed to represent. However, the paint jobs are, well, kind of lacking if not altogether kind of poor, but you do have to understand that these were originally meant as free pack-ins. Which is kind of funny because back in the day in the late 80s and early 90s, I totally remember these things not being very popular with collectors. Which is, a really, sh which is really a shame because really PVC figurines in general weren't very popular until the late 90s and early 2000s, so these micro figures were kind of ahead of their time. And first up we have the Cobra Bat, Battle Android Trooper. This is a really great representation of the Bat, especially the chest sculpt. It's a perfect representation of what was a sticker on the action figure. Unfortunately, the left hand is really small. It's totally out of proportion with the rest of the figurine. And here's Beachhead the Ranger. I've tried to arrange the action figure to match the PVC figurine to the best of my abilities, but I'm not quite sure what the sculptors were trying to do with this pose. It almost looks like Beachhead has been shot mid-run and is stumbling backwards. That's not really a classic army man pose. He's not even holding his weapon at the ready. And speaking of classic army men poses, here we have Bazooka, the missile specialist. 
Well, on the surface, this is a perfect representation of bazooka in very simplified form. There are actually three things that are very strange about the sculpt of this figurine. The first is the weapon, which is actually that of the 1985 Footloose's M73, instead of Bazooka's proper MAT missile launcher. The second is his helmet, which as you can see has sculpted in foliage. That's not correct to Bazooka, but that's more like the 1985 Footloose again. But what's not like Bazooka or Footloose is Bazooka's blue collar here, which is sculpted in with a little knot at the back, suggesting that that's not a collar at all, but a bandana. Who's that supposed to represent? Next, we have Buzzer the Dreadnought. While this might not be a classic army man pose, it is a very dynamic pose. Somebody in the production team must have really loved the Dreadnoughts, or maybe Buzzer in particular, because he has the most paint apps out of any of the micro figures. He has six. That translates to a lot of attention to detail. Next we have the head snake himself, Cobra Commander. As you can see, they opted for a darker Cobra blue instead of the light blue that he traditionally comes with when he's wearing his battle mask. I have to admit, I do kind of like this. And here's what the official checklist calls a Cobra officer, but it is clearly a Cobra soldier or Cobra trooper instead. I think the department in charge of producing these micro figures must have thought that officer sounded better than just trooper or soldier. But clearly this is the trooper because of the knee pads and the SVD sniper rifle, as opposed to the officer who would have come with an AK-47. And here we have the Crimson Guard. Since nothing else really looks like a Crimson Guard, it's not that hard to simplify his form. But I think this micro figure really suffers from the lack of paint apps. I think a little bit of silver detail would have made this figurine really pop. And here's everyone's favorite weapons dealer, Destro. While this is a great representation of Destro in simplified form, I always thought mine was broken. It looks like the tip of his pistol is missing, but that's the way it was molded. I'm not quite sure why they don't have a thin barrel on it, like the Cobra Trooper slash Officer or Major Blood. Next, there's the G.I. Joe's first shirt himself, Duke. This micro figure version of Duke actually has the 1983 Snow Jobs rifle instead of what the action figure originally came with, meaning that he's actually closer to the original card art than he is the action figure. Unfortunately, my version is kind of suffering from a bit of discoloration, which is fairly common on the Duke figure. And here's the G.I. Joe warrant officer, Flint. I'll have to be perfectly honest on this one. Because while the sculpt overall is a fairly good representation of Flint, I don't like his face sculpt at all. It's just so wide and bulky. And here's the original infantry trooper, Grunt. While you can't get a more army man looking figurine than this, I do kind of wish they had darkened the green plastic a bit. One interesting thing is that he's only one of two figures that has their backpack on. And here we have Gung Ho, the G.I. Joe Marine. Well, I'm glad they kept one of his most distinguishing features. That's right, he's got his big bushy mustache.
Next is General Hawk, the G.I. Joe Commander. Like the Crimson Guard, this is just an okay representation of Hawk. I really do wish they had put some gold paint on him, just to sort of make him pop a bit. And here's the one-eyed Cobra Mercenary, Major Blood. While the micro figure is a little bit plain, that's the way the original action figure was. So it's hard to complain about the lack of paint tops on this guy. And here we have Quick Kick, the master of silent weapons. Well, this is an interesting choice on the part of the sculptors. Instead of giving him his action figure accessory, the nunchuck or the sword, they gave him a ninja star from his red sash, which was just a sculpted on part on the action figure. And here we have my main man, Roadblock the Heavy Machine Gunner in his second version outfit. This is one of the more interesting sculpts for the micro figures because it actually adds two things which were missing from the action figure, such as a strap aiding in holding up the machine gun as well as some type of an ammo box or ammo magazine for the machine gun. Again, lacking in the action figure. And here we have Rock and Roll, the Gatling Gunner. Basically, Rock and Roll version 2. What's that? That's not Rock and Roll as my action figure example? Well, no, that's Repeater, which is what this figurine is based on. From the neck down, he's actually Repeater. But his head is clearly that of 1989 Rock and Roll. Collectors speculate endlessly as to why this is a mashup of the 1988 Repeater and a 1989 Rock and Roll. But the prevailing theory is that the sculptors got the wrong information, basically Repeater's information, and had to change it to Rock and Roll really quickly, so they just did the head, and that's it. Next we have Snake Eyes, the Commando in his second version uniform. This is a very interesting choice, going with the 1985 second version of his uniform instead of the 1989 third version, which would have been concurrent with the time that this was released. Also, I don't know why they gave him two swords. Instead of one sword and an Uzi, which I think would have been easier to sculpt, to be honest. And here's the large Sarge himself, Sergeant Slaughter. This figure is really popular by itself on the aftermarket because of the cross appeal with wrestling fans. Also, I really like the sculpt. Not only is the pose great, but the scale is great as well. It's larger than the normal micro figure, which is correct because the action figure itself was larger than three and three quarter inches. And finally, we have the G.I. Joe's second Navy SEAL wetsuit. And here we have possibly the most inaccurate of the micro figures. Sure, his sculpting is basically wetsuit, but not only is he not supposed to be green like this, this micro figure comes with a harpoon gun, which I'll admit is something that the action figure really did need because the action figure doesn't come with a weapon at all. The Mail Wave micro figures poster is a whopping 20 inches by 28 inches big. I placed mine in a frame just for convenience sake, so please forgive the glare. It's actually rather a shame that Hasbro never produced any more posters like this with the toys photographed in a lineup. I'm sure they would have been really popular, but I guess that's what we have 3D Joes now for. When the figurines were made available through mail order, you automatically got the poster too. Unfortunately, Hasbro sent them folded in quarters and not rolled up. That means there will always be fold lines on original posters. In some ways, the poster differs from the prototype shown here. For the actual poster, someone in the production team felt it was necessary to add extra detail. Eyes are now painted in, as are belts and other details, which is fine since it, it is enlarged. But now Snake Eyes has red trim, 
The Cobra Trooper slash officer has a silver helmet, and the Crimson Guard has a blue chest? Why? Following the prototype, the file cards have some oddities too. Roadblock and Rock and Roll use their original version 1 file cards. Sergeant Slaughter uses a hand-drawn portrait instead of the normal painted one. Wetsuit's portrait is from the Toys R Us exclusive repaint Special Mission Brazil 5-pack. And the text for Destro's file card is from the 1988 Iron Grenadiers version. Well, that's all the time I have right now. Please check out my Facebook page for more information and behind the scenes photos for these reviews. Thank you for watching this video and stay tuned for next time to see another 1980s G.I. Joe tour review. See you then.